afternoon. In this session, uh, I will explain about the important considerations in the design of shear walls, coupling beams, post tension slab, and the basement walls. First, uh, I will start the uh, shear walls. We are using the shear walls to resist, uh, to use as a primary vector force resisting system. Uh, in the tall buildings, the shear walls are proportioned and detailed to resist shear, moments, and uh, axial forces when the building sways uh, through the during the oscill uh, oscillation and the strong points. Shear wall provides the uh, stiffness as well as the strength in resisting the uh, strong earthquake ground motions. First, uh, I will discuss about the provisioning of, provisioning of the shear wall thickness. In ACI 318, uh, there is no specific uh, prescriptive minimum uh, thickness requirement. But the minimum thickness should be at least uh, 200 millimeter as a lower limit for special reinforced concrete shear walls. But uh, for the construction and performance, if we use at least 300 millimeter, it will it would be it will in, improve the constructability if we have the special boundary zone uh, elements. <coughs> if we have the conventional reinforced coupling beams, we should increase the shear wall thickness in an image to 350 millimeter. If we have the diagonal reinforced coupling beams, we should use at least uh, 400 millimeter thickness to avoid the congestion of the diagonal reinforcement going to the boundary element of the shear walls. For the shear wall reinforcement, uh, we provided vertical and horizontal reinforcement. The minimum reinforcement ratio for both direction should be at least 0 0.0025, 20, 0.25 percent for the special reinforced concrete shear. But if the shear demand is low, we can reduce the uh, sh uh, re we can reduce the reinforcement. But if the uh, shear wall is short for the squat walls, the transverse uh, reinforcement should not be less than the longitudinal reinforcement. This is the typical uh, shear wall reinforcement layout. We have provided the, we provided the boundaries of the boundary element. And this is the horizontal reinforcement is for uh, shear reinforcement, uh, is for shear, and vertical reinforcement is for axial load and bending moment. This table is from ACI 318-2014. Uh, for the minimum require minimum reinforcement requires requirement for the walls. There are two types of walls. One is uh, we call it a slender walls, which has the height over length of the wall is greater than or equal to two. And another type of wall is the squat wall, which has high over length ratio is less than or equal to 0 0.5. For slender walls, they are their behavior is mostly in uh, flexure, mostly like uh, flexure cantilever, and we prefer tactile yielding mostly at the uh, base uh, without the shear failure under the seismic load. But for the squat wall, it resists the uh, lateral load in the diagonal strap uh, mechanism and concrete uh, and distributed horizontal and vertical uh, reinforcement versus the shear demand. The wall behavior transition between the, those two extremes uh, 
for that you can mediate uh, aspect ratios. I will focus uh, in this session. I will focus on the slender walls because we are discussing for the uh, design of tall buildings. In the slender walls, uh, when we design, uh, normally we uh, provide the tactile factual behavior at the base of the wall uh, when the, it gives in uh, factual mode. Some of the, sometimes we double the shear walls by the doubling beam and provide the uh, yielding mechanism in the coupling beam as well. <coughs> but we have to avoid the shear walls, shear failure, and diaphragm uh, failure and foundation failure during the earthquakes, which cannot allow yielding in those uh, modes. This is the yielding mechanism of the cantilever shear wall. When we design the shear wall, we have to select the critical section, uh, which is which has a flexural strength uh, closely matching uh, with the required strength, and then other locations uh, above we provide the uh, over strength. Uh, we provide the over strength. At the critical location, we have to provide the confinement to provide the proper ductile uh, response, and we relax the detailing in the uh, upper portion. But for the high, uh, high rise buildings, uh, higher modes, higher vibration modes are significant. So in that case, the shear wall may yield in the mid height of the building. So in that case, we may need to provide some confinement to provide the tactile behavior at the mid height of the building. Key factors to improve the cyclic tactility is uh, we have to keep the compressive stress and shear stress uh, low and the seismic loading. And we have to provide proper confinement to stable the factual comp compression zone, not to get uh, co uh, concrete crashing failure, and also avoid the splice failures. To control the uh, compressive loading, we should provide the capacity uh, in such a way that axial force is well below the balance point. In UBC 97, <coughs> there is a limit for the special reinforced concrete shear wall. The axial compressive load demand should be less than 35% of the axial capacity of the uh, wall. But that limit can apply only for the is can apply only for the rectangular planar walls. For the other shapes of wall, this limit may not be <coughs> correct. That 0.35 uh, p naught is uh, generally in rectangular wall. It is uh, at the balance point. In ACI 318, there is no limit like a UBC 97. But we have to avoid the concrete strain which has 0.003 before that tension reinforcement yield to avoid the brittle failure. To achieve the tactile yielding in flexural mode, we should also reduce the shear stresses in the shear wall. Generally, in ACI 318, chapter, uh, in ACI 318, uh, chapter 21, the, there is a limit for the maximum capacity, uh, shear capacity check. That limit is 0 0.83 square root of F prime, F prime 3 for the megapascal unit. So, if this, that is the code requirement, but uh, to get to improve the tactile factual yielding, we should limit to 0.33 to 0.5 instead of 0.83 uh, to improve the tactility. But for the uh, uh, 
patients where the factor of diagnosis the max are low, we can use the uh, higher limits. These are the sum sample pictures of the concrete crashing and reinforcement battling in the shear wall. On the left side, uh, it is the concrete uh, compression failure due to the uh, lack of uh, proper confinement. And the right side, the, 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 it is the rebar packing. And also, uh, we have to uh, provide the proper detailing for the left slices of the vertical reinforcement. Sometimes if we provide the left slice, left slices at the base of the wall, it can, uh, it will increase the bending moment capacity of the wall and our intended flexural uh, hinge zone may be shifted up. Because the, at the left slices, the reinforcement uh, ratio will be increased. And also left slices subjected to uh, multiple yielding cycles can unzip uh, and thus they are well uh, confined by the confinement reinforcement. In ACI 318, it requires slice, slice length uh, 1.25 times uh, <coughs> for FY intention, but there is no requirement for confinement. But we should, but better practice, in better practice we should provide the confinement, although we provide 1.25 times, especially in the uh, critical sessions. Generally, when we design the shear walls, we design for the flexure, in-bake flexure, and in-bake shear. We mostly focus uh, those uh, failure modes in design. We do not uh, take care on the lateral buckling, out of plane buckling of the shear walls. But in recent earthquake, Chile earthquake in 2010, some of the shear walls fail in out of plane backing, especially in the slender walls. That uh, backing is influenced by the residual tensile strain in the wall due to uh, real loading to the, uh, in the opposite direction. This is the, another example of the wall backing. Uh, and are in uh, Christchurch earthquake in 2011. Lateral buckling are of, in the previously yielded wall, the, clap, the crack closure and the deformation uh, reversal uh, may require the yielding of reinforcement in compression. When we normally we provide uh, two layers of particle uh, reinforcement in each uh, in, in the shear wall, and any slight uh, a symmetry of the yielding of that vertical reinforcement can generate the buckling of the out of plane buckling of the wall. This is the failure mode of the local buckling of the shear wall. So uh, to avoid the local buckling out of plane buckling of the wall. In US practice, uh, we determine the minimum thickness based on the uh, height, uh, height of the wall divided by the uh, thickness of the wall. It should be less than or equal to 10 in the intended inch region. Uh, example, at the base of the wall. For the other locations, we allow until H2 over B ratio uh, less than or equal to 16. This is the uh, curve to determine the, uh, to check the slenderness effect of the uh, wall. So, if we, uh, for the strong earthquake regions, uh, normally we have the shear walls of uh, 600, 700, sometimes it goes to 1 meter thickness. But the floor height is, uh, let's say, about 3.2 meters. So, 
local parking uh, hardly do occur. But for the moderate and low seismic region, our shear wall thicknesses are not that uh, large in the tall buildings. Maybe it will, we will use only 200 to 300 millimeter thickness. So in that patch, the story height is say 3.2 meter high. So in that case, we should take care for, to, to check the shear wall, uh, the, uh, the out of plane pattern. When we design the shear wall uh, for the moment, we should provide, uh, we should concentrate the vertical reinforcement at the uh, boundaries of the wall. It will provide the convenience zone for the uh, transverse reinforcement, uh, for the confinement, as well as the curvature capacity and also it increases the bending moment at capacity. <laughs> and also it improves the local uh, distribution of the flexural cracks and the yielding of the shear wall compared to the providing the uniform reinforcement throughout the length of the wall. This is the sample picture of providing the concentrated reinforcement at the uh, boundary of the wall and distributed reinforcement. On the left side, uh, we provided the uh, concentrated longitudinal bars back here. The, the longitudinal bars are uniformly distributed. So if we provide this one, it, pro it improves the curvature capacity as well as the uh, cracks are uh, distributed. But here it will generate a large crack not distributed and the performance uh, will not be good. When we uh, do the moment design in the co uh, procedure for the slender walls, first uh, we have to select the critical section, generally okay, at the base. Then we have to determine the design moment and view from the uh, load combinations, from uh, the linear analysis, that those load combinations will, uh, will be uh, seismic loading will be divided by R or scale to the equivalent static base shear, then we get the design moment. Then uh, we decide the uh, location for the primary healing at the base. Then to, at the base, the critical section, we have to satisfy, we have to provide the re vertical reinforcement to satisfy that moment and you. Then we have to calculate the factual over strength factor phi naught. That phi naught is the moment capacity of the uh, at that critical section divided by the, uh, the the moment domain. For example, if we design the uh, moment DC ratio at that section, uh, let's say. Uh, 0 0.7. So the in in the uh, in one load combination, which provides the maximum uh, moment capacity, so the phi naught will be one over uh, 0 0.7. This is the uh, lecture over strength factor. Then we have to amplify the design moment based on that over strength factor. Multiply mu prime. Uh, we multiply mu with uh, phi naught to get the, uh, to consider the over strength. Then we have to uh, consider the dynamic amplification effect, uh, factor omega. That omega is typically varying around uh, 1.25. Uh, but in New Zealand codes, there are uh, other formulas to calculate the omega factor. We further multiply that. Uh, design moment with omega. So our design moment becomes omega multiplied with phi naught and mu. Then uh, we design that uh, 
moment for remaining uh, apple portions. So apple portion moment uh, demand is amplified by uh, omega and phi naught. So we allow yielding and we prevent the fracture yielding of the shear wall in the upper portions. In uh, shear walls, the boundary elements are very important under the seismic loading because large compressive stresses occurred. In ACI 318, there are two, two, types, uh, two procedures which design for the uh, boundary zone elements. One procedure is based on the uh, roof displacement of the building, and that procedure is good for the symbol walls, uh, planar walls. But for the uh, com uh, complicated uh, configurations of shear wall layout, that procedure may not work. So I will focus on the second procedure, which is based on the compressive stress of the, uh, based on the compressive stress uh, in the shear wall. In ACI uh, 318, if the compressive stress under the seismic loading is more than 0.2 F prime C. We have to provide the confinement reinforcement. But if the compressive stress is lower than 0.15 F prime C, we do not need to provide the confinement reinforcement. So how to decide the boundary zone gap? We can decide from our analysis, for example, in EDAPS model, after we analyze the building and check uh, to find the load combinations, and we can see the uh, axial stress in the shear walls, the shells, shell elements. We have to check the F22 stress from the uh, shell elements and see the stress contour. If the stress contour is more than 0.2 F prime C, we have to provide that zone. Uh, <coughs> we have to provide the boundary uh, confinement reinforcement in that boundary zone. So normally in the lower levels, we will have larger compressive stress in the boundary zone, and boundary zone length will be larger. But in the upper one, in the upper walls, if the compressive stress is reduced, we can reduce the boundary zone length. This is the uh, typical uh, detail of the special boundary zone element which is mentioned in uh, ACI uh, 318. Here, this uh, length of the boundary zone, this is from the procedure, uh, first procedure, which is based on the displacement of the uh, building. But if we check based on the stress, we do not need to use uh, this one. We just see the stress contour in our analysis model and uh, determine, uh, decide the boundary zone length. And another important thing is we provide the boundary zone length, and this is the shear reinforcement coming uh, inside the boundary zone. This shear, the code suggests. This shear reinforcement should go inside the boundary zone from the edge of the wall and 150 millimeter from the edge of the wall. For example, for very tall for the tall buildings, the boundary zone length will be quite big, maybe one meter, two meter boundary zone length. So in that case, we may uh, terminate the boundary zone. Uh, we may terminate the shear wall shear reinforcement at the entry of the boundary zone and remaining one meter may not have the, may not continue that one. In that case, we should check the uh, shear capacity of that boundary zone using the confinement reinforcement that shear capacity should not be less than the uh, middle portion. But if we have the 
squad wars. This uh, shear wall, shear reinforcement should go to the uh, 150 millimeter from the edge. Uh, to try, if we check with the strap and die approach, the tension poses in this uh, shear, in this uh, horizontal reinforcement should go to the uh, joint. If we do not need the special boundary zone element, we may uh, we should pro provide the wall boundary zone with the ordinary boundary zone element. This is the uh, ordinary boundary zone element detail. This is the assemble of the boundary zone elements in the shear wall. So in the lower zone, we provide the special boundary zone, but if there is, uh, no, if we do not need the, if the stress is low, we, and if uh, area of uh, steel uh, at the boundary element and area of concrete at the boundary element is greater than 400 uh, by FY, we have to provide the bound, uh, ordinary boundary zone element, but other portion we do not need. But we should provide at least boundary, uh, ordinary boundary element in the other portion as well. In design of uh, uh, shear walls, after, after we calculate the boundary zone uh, element and uh, reinforcement requirement, we have to decide the particle reinforcement layout. To decide the uh, boundary zone, to decide the particle reinforcement layout, uh, first we calculate the boundary zone length from the stress contours and then we got the required boundary zone element and uh, boundary zone reinforcement and we lay out the uh, hoops reinforcement inside the boundary zone. Then, based on that uh, confinement reinforcement, we provide the, uh, we locate the vertical reinforcement. Then, we check with that layout, uh, we develop the PMM curve with that layout, and check the uh, PMM uh, demands are within that capacity curve or not. If not, we have to increase the diameter or increase, uh, revise the, uh, reinforcement layout in the boundary zone and uh, recheck. But in the middle zone, we will provide the uniform reinforcement, uh, maybe 0.25%, uh, which satisfies the uh, minimum requirement. So in the so so in the previous procedure, the boundary zone uh, reinforcement layout dictates the particle reinforcement layout. And another alternative procedure is just provide the particle reinforcement inside the uh, boundary zone length and check the confinement reinforcement in the boundary zone. And if that one is not uh, satisfying the capa uh, capacity requirement, I trade it until it's satisfied. But the first uh, procedure, in my opinion, is better. We decide the confinement reinforcement and provide the uh, confinement layout, then provide the variable rebar. After doing the shear uh, fracture design, we continue the shear design. We have to dis, uh, determine the shear wall, uh, shear demand from the uh, analysis, model uh, response spectrum analysis or equivalent natural load analysis and with the uh, load factors. Then we have to check the shear capacity. These, these procedures uh, suggest that if we use that amplification, that's uh, 
over, with the overstrength factor, we can use the phi factor of 0 0.75. If we do not amplify the shear domain with the uh, phi factor, a uh, phi naught factor, we have to use the strength reduction factor phi to 0 0.6. So that phi naught factor is coming from the uh, moment uh, capacity divided by the moment domain. So previously we have showed in the moment design. So if we over design the moment, our shear demand will shear design, uh, shear uh, demand force to be designed will be increased. But if uh, it is better to, it is more conservative if we use that uh, phi naught factor over strength factor in the shear design together with the strength reduction factor of 0 0.75 is more conservative than using uh, strength reduction factor of 0 0.6 alone without uh, over strength amplification. This is the typical, uh, this is the <coughs> shear design uh, formula that we use for this. Uh, special reinforced concrete shear walls. When this, uh, the first equation is the calculation of the shear capacity considering both concrete and transverse uh, horizontal reinforcement. Even uh, we satisfy that uh, capacity with the shear demand, we have to check these limits. For the individual wall segments, we have to check with 0 0.83 ACB in the square root of prime C for the individual wall segment. But for the multiple wall segments sharing, uh, sharing a common lateral load, we should check with 0 0.66 uh, ACB in the square root of prime C. When we check the shear wall shear, we have to check leg by leg. For example, if we have the C-shaped shear wall, we have to check for each leg, so we have to check three legs. Then, first two equation we will uh, use for each, uh, first equation and third equation we will use for each leg, and then combined uh, shear wall uh, check, 0 0.66 will be used for the uh, two flanges of the C-shaped section. Another uh, confusion in design is if we have the vertical uh, structure element, uh, long structure element, we, it is difficult for us, sometimes difficult for us to decide it, is, it should be designed as a wall or designed as a column. In ACI 318 uh, 2014, it mentions, in chapter 2, it mentioned that if horizontal band to thickness ratio are greater than 3, we should uh, design as a wall. And in US practice, the wall pier is defined as a relatively narrow vertical. Uh, segment that is essentially as a column, but uh, dimension do not uh, satisfy the requirements of special moment resisting frame, which has the ratio of uh, length to thickness ratio of 2.5. Uh, if length, of, length to thickness ratio less than 2.5, we should design that uh, wall component as a column. But if it is between 2.5 and 6, we should use the section 18. Uh, this is from uh, ACI 318 2014. Uh, section 18.10.8.1 for uh, satisfying the column design requirements or alternate requirements uh, to, through A to F. If L by B ratio more than 6, we can design as a wall. This is the ECI requirement. 
or different uh, wall dimensions. <coughs> Four walls uh, pairs with uh, the ratio of uh, LY ratio between 2.5 and 6. We should design that wall to uh, consider to consider the especially to satisfy the shear demand forces from the uh, from above wall and the uh, and transfer to the uh, lower wall. Here, this is the sample of the wall pier failure. This is the wall pier, which is uh, sometimes we have the uh, opening in the wall, and this portion we design as a wall pier depending on the ratio of the uh, height over, so depending on the length over thickness of thickness ratio of the wall. So. For this case, if we uh, want to design, we have to transfer this shear force to this uh, smaller uh, length wall by this uh, collector reinforcement. And then, and then design this wall. And also, we have to provide another collector reinforcement to transfer to the lower wall. If we do not properly design this uh, wall pier, can damage in the uh, shear failure under the earthquake. And another important thing is the uh, wall panel zones. We do not take care too much uh, attention. We do not give too much attention on the wall panel zone, which are also very critical. Uh, in the sh uh, shear design of the walls. These panel zones uh, are the regions which the forces of the adjacent wall segments are resolved. So there will be large shear, stre shear stresses in those panel zones. In uh, Professor Jack Mill's book, the, this is the shear uh, capacity of the panel zone uh, based on the concrete and uh, steel strength. But for the steel, we have to use the minimum uh, reinforcement ratio of either vertical or horizontal reinforcement. This is the shear, shear stress limit in the panel zone. Especially panel zones are important when the uh, wall intersects with the basement wall or at the outrigger level, they are. Uh, the shear stress in those panel zones are quite significant. This is the damage in the uh, panel zone, sample damage. This is from the uh, California earthquake in 1989. Normally, when we provide the vertical reinforcement of this two wall left and right, we provide the non-result uh, reinforcement throughout. And then this one, when we think uh, that one, we, we just never know Tension development led to the uh, lower wall, which has no opening. We thought that this one is uh, enough. Normally, we provide this one uh, only tension development length. But in this zone, there will be large shear stresses here. So this tension with this uh, boundary zone particle reinforcement should continue at least uh, one double below the uh, Opening. Here, this is the suggestion from the Professor Jack Bailey. Uh, this, at the end of the opening, this boundary zone reinforcement should go 1.5 times uh, length of the opening. <coughs> so we should extend this one. So we will, and also we have to provide the core reinforcement to transfer the. Uh, shear stresses in this uh, panel zone. Another type is of the wall is the flat wall that we uh, sometimes use as a our trigger uh, effect. In 
in the flat ball system, uh, sometimes you will have the openings, the openings in the flat ball. This is the main core wall, and this is the outrigger column. And this flat wall will act as the outrigger, uh, uh, outrigger to transfer, uh, to transfer the lateral load uh, moments of the <coughs> core wall to the uh, columns as the axial nodes. So in that optical system, when we design, uh, we should we can uh, we can also design as a capacity based with a capacity based design approach. Here, when we check the shear wall, this flat wall shear, we can determine from the shear capacity of these mean beams. The shear demand in this flat wall, will, particle shear demand in this flat wall, will not be larger than this shear capacity of these thin beams. So we calculate the shear capacity of those thin beams and use as a demand in this uh, flat wall particle shear and design the flat wall shear. And then for the overturning moment in the flat wall, we have to provide the longitudinal reinforcement in those thin beams. Uh, to get the uh, capacity, flexural capacity. And for the any moment of the flat wall, we, this, we know the shear capacity of this flat wall. So this, use that shear VU in this outrigger column and multiply with this span, we will get the bending moment and design for that bending moment. In uh, performance-based evaluation of shear walls, uh, we have to model the shear wall structure as a nonlinear with the, using the fiber, uh, nonlinear fiber elements. <coughs> These, and we consider the autoplate response and shear response as a linear. And we have to consider the concrete confinement effect in the fiber material properties. And <coughs> for the in, and in, in the evaluation, we have to check the axial strains of concrete and reinforcing, and check the shear capacity. This is the sample stress rate curve of confined concrete and unconfined concrete and fiber layout in the shear walls. This is the sample results of the axial strain check of the uh, shear wall. On the left side, it is the compressive stress in the concrete, and the right side is the tens Tensile, sorry, compressive strain in concrete and the right side is the tensile strain in the steel. The limits uh, we use for the end confined concrete limit is 0.003, but intermediate confined concrete is 0.004. But fully confined concrete it is quite far, 0 0.015. This is the sample of uh, one location of the uh, Shear wall corner. We have to check all the corners of the shear wall. This is the sample result of the uh, shear wall shear check. This is the uh, this red line is the capacity considering the concrete and steel. This blue line is the uh, maximum capacity limit using 0 0.83 square root of f prime c. And this is the uh, this capacity check is for this line. Okay, coupling beams. We uh, couple the shear walls with the coupling beams if we have the openings. There are two types uh, the, of coupling beams. One is the diagonal coupling beam and another one is conventional reinforced coupling beam, like moment frame beams. If the L by H ratio is more than four, we use normal the conventional reinforced beam, but L by H is less than two and uh, shear demand is large, we use diagonal reinforced coupling beams. This is the uh, diagram to decide which type of coupling beam to reduce. So for the conventional reinforced coupling beam, we just design as a special moment resisting frame uh, beams. And shear demand should be checked should be checked based on the moment uh, probable moment shear. <coughs> And confinement should be provided uh, with the hoops at distance 2h from the as, from the support. 
and within that two edge support, one which uh, calculate the shear capacity of that beam, we should consider only the uh, rebar strength, the shear reinforcement strength, not the concrete uh, shear strength. This is a typical detail of the uh, conventional reinforced sculpting beam. In uh, diagonal reinforced sculpting beam, we design only for shear, not no moment. So this is the shear capacity formula. And when we design, when we calculate the shear capacity of the diagonal reinforced beam, we have to take care of the uh, inclination angle of the diagonal bars, which uh, angle, uh, which is uh, alpha. We have to take care when we calculate that one, we should uh, use the center line of the diagonal and consider the uh, concrete cover properly when we calculate. Because slightly uh, changes in the alpha value, it will change the uh, shear capacity. This is the typical detail of the diagonal reinforced coupling beam. There are two types. One is Fully, when one is confinement is provided at the diagonal, and another one is confinement is provided in the entire beam section. No confinement in the diagonals. And also, we have to take care the longitudinal reinforcement in the beam. It should not develop inside the wall. We do not want to develop the uh, moment uh, in, in the coupling beam. In performance-based evaluation of coupling beams, we have to check the uh, rotations in the conventional reinforced beam. But for the diagonal reinforced beam, we have to check the uh, shear rotations. For conventional, we have to check the flexure rotations and shear capacity. And the rotation limits come from the ASCE 4113. This is the nonlinear modeling of uh, Coupling beams. For conventional reinforced beam, we provide the moment hinges at the end of the beam. For the diagonal reinforced beam, we provide the shear hinge, the space fan hinge at the mid span of the beam. But the sh there should not be uh, shear deformation in, the, in this span. Only shear deformation is left at the mid span. These are the sample uh, backbone curve for the conventional reinforced coupling beam and diagonal reinforced beam. We will explain how to model in details in our workshop section. These are the uh, ASCE 41 criteria for the uh, conventional reinforced coupling beam and uh, conventional reinforced coupling beam and diagonal reinforced coupling beam. In ASCE uh, 41 criteria, the collapse prevention limit for the conventional reinforced coupling beam is 0 0.04 radian. But uh, we should also understand what will happen, what will be the damage if we have the that level of rotation. So these are the from the some test results. As you can see, if we have the 0 0.05 radian. You can see the damage is quite uh, severe. If it is 0.06, it is almost gone. These are the some sample of the uh, diagonal reinforced beam. Diagonal reinforced beam at 0 0.06 radian is not badly damaged as the conventional reinforced beam. And these are the sum sample results from the performance-based evaluation of the coupling beams, uh, which we check the rotation along the height of the building. This is the rotation limit, 0.05 radian, and this coupling beam is checked. This black line is the average of seven ground motion. in the seismic regions as a gravity load uh, resisting system. In, size, uh, in size, high seismic regions, we 
use those post action slabs in conjunction with the natural load resisting system such as core wall. But they are not the post action slab is not resisting the lateral load, but core wall is resisting 100 percent of lateral load. But that post action slab has to carry the gravity load and a uh, large displacement and the lateral load. According to seismic provisions in ACR 318, members uh, which are not part of the lateral load resisting system, uh, it prefers as a non-participating system. And we have to check those uh, systems whether uh, they can carry the gravity load and a large displacement. For the slab volume connections, uh, the important thing is the punching shear, uh, where the unbalanced moment is generated at, at that connection, and the, the uh, lateral load. So in ACI 318, there is a limit for the normal RC slab. We have to check, first we have to check the shear, gravity shear DC ratio, and then we have to check the design drift ratio. If we design the we design the uh, PD slab only for gravity loading, and if we design uh, the DC ratio of let's say 0.3 and uh, the gravity the shear DC ratio of 0.3 and uh, the gravity, we can allow the story drift until 2 percent and uh, the uh, and the uh, uh, If we do not design uh, for low uh, DC ratio and let's say if we design for 0.6, we cannot allow the large drift. We have to allow only 0.5% drift. So if the drift ratio is large, let's say if it is 1.5%, we should our uh, DC ratio should be less than 0 0.6. In performance based procedure, we check the in elastic rotation instead of the the punching shear uh, shear DC ratio and drift. This elastic uh, in elastic rotation also depends on the uh, punching shear uh, DC ratio. If we have larger margin of safety, it allows more uh, rotation in the pitch. This is the linear modeling of uh, slab beams. Uh, we have to, we cannot, in perform 3D, we cannot model the, the shell nonlinear in the slab. So we have to model like equivalent beam and provide the images uh, at the end of the slab beams. Uh, like this one. And this is a sample by both class of the slab beam. Then we have the moment rotation at each end. These are the uh, Second criteria for normal flat slab and post-action flat slab. One important thing is uh, the continuity reinforcement should be provided uh, inside the slab. Uh, in PT slab, at least one candidate should be pass passing through the column cage. Here, this is the uh, second criteria from ACI. Uh, sorry, ESC 41. <coughs> This, if we do not have the continuity reinforcement, the acceptable limit is small. If we have the continuity, continuity reinforcement, acceptable limit is large. So, but we have to take care that this acceptable uh, uh, limit is at the strength loss. So it means that we allow the category action of the modern uh, reinforcement. Uh, the slab will, uh, will be damaged, but it is hanging between the column. So, although the code, uh, uh, although ESC 41 allow until this limit, if many flaws having uh, close to this limit is not good, because it looks like the slab in all flaws, many flaws are hanging like this, catenary uh, action, catenary action. So, Few flaws are okay, but we prefer to uh, the limit should be well below this uh, before the strength loss.
start the laboratory test results uh, damage pattern of the uh, post engine slab and the lacquer load. This is a sample result uh, of one of the slab beam in our project uh, along the eye of the building. Uh, but this location is the location is small because uh, there are uh, there is a PRV of flat walls of here. And uh, the last one is the basement wall. <coughs> Normally, when we design the basement wall, we focus on the out of plane flexure and out of plane shear coming from the uh, soil pressure. But for seismic design, we should take care not only out of plane action, also the in plane action of the basement walls. We have to design the Inertial, for the out of plane action, we have to design for inertial component as well as the kinematic component. Inertial component is the uh, pressure coming from the <coughs> mass of the <coughs> pressure coming from the mass of the soil to the uh, basement wall and kinematic. Sorry, inertial component is the uh, coming the pressure coming from the movement of the building to the uh, retaining wall and retaining wall push the swan. Another one is the pressure coming from the mass of the swan and mass of the, that mass of the swan is accelerating and pushing the, the basement wall. Not only that, we have to check the uh, intake shear because at the basement level, the diaphragm poses from the tower will transfer to the basement wall. So these basement wall will act as a shear wall. So we have to provide the horizontal reinforcement in the basement wall to resist the shear demand. Inertia component is, as I explained, inertia component is the movement of the basement and kinematic component. We can calculate uh, mm -hmm. approximately by using this formula. <laughs> in this formula, uh, this K8 is the PGA of the density uh, level response spectrum. This is the inner weight of swat, and this is the height of the retaining wall. And that kinematic component uh, pressure diagram is like a trapezium shape, not like uh, normal swat or water pressure diagram a triangle shape. So when we design the normally, when we check the kinematic component pressures are quite higher than the inertial component, and for the, to design the kinematic component, we have to calculate the normal air pressure, active air pressure, together with the kinematic component and design the out of plane response. And important thing is uh, in retaining the engagement wall, if we uh, to transfer the intake shear from the diaphragm of the basement, we have to provide the uh, shear friction reinforcement. It depends on the uh, construction sequence. If the cold line is here, the shear friction reinforcement will be like this. This, if the cold line is here, the shear friction reinforcement will be like this. This line should be uh, on the action development line. The shear capacity of this uh, wall will be, the formula will be same as the shear capacity of the shear wall. Okay, thank you.